Okay, so we're recording. My name is Wesahana Pearson, and I'm recording for Black Asia Magazine. And I'm talking to a panel of men who live in different Asian cities. So let me not introduce them. Let's just go down the line. So first we're gonna do Hong Kong, then Manila, then Saigon, then Bangkok. All right, my name's Al Solomon, AKA MC Element OP. I'm hailing in Hong Kong. I'm originally from Miami, Florida, United States. And here, uh, I'm a software engineer slash author slash content creator on YouTube and such and so forth. Okay, then there's Kareem. Hey guys, Kareem Jackson. I am um, from Kansas City, Missouri. Actually, I grew up in California. Um, my family had international business when I was a kid, so I was blessed to be able to have that already. But now I live in um, the Philippines Islands, actually very close to Manila, just outside Manila a few minutes. And I have an media development company that I really market here, KareemAntonio.com. I help entrepreneurs globally to kind of level up their companies and to get more Americanized. I also publish at Philippines Magazine International, um, Blue Book Con Magazine International. Um, I do some lifestyle magazines. I have a radio show, a TV show. I have a show here on digital. Um, you can see all of that at KareemAntonio.com. So um, I think that's it, right? That's it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here, Thank man. you. Glad to be here, man. All right. Cool. All right. So, Jawanza, you're up next. Um, Jawanza Kalunji Hobson. Uh, my stage name is J.K. Hobson because my name is Jawanza Kalunji Hobson. So, uh, uh, I'm from. I was born in Puerto Rico, but I grew up in New York City, and I lived in Southern California for 16 years before I moved to Saigon, Vietnam. And out here, I'm a stand-up comedian. I'm a writer. I write for Toy Tre, which is a. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, national magazine here. Also, I have a channel called Asia Out Loud on, uh, on Facebook and freelance writing and, uh, and I teach English part-time. Okay, all right, awesome. thank you for sharing that. And then Dr. Roland Amasu. Roland, can you pick up next? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Roland Amasu. Uh, I'm originally from Benin. Uh, Benin it is a very small country, but it was a big kingdom in the past. It's called the Kingdom of Dahomey. And uh, the reason why I'm referring to the Kingdom of Dahomey is that many things that we're talking about started there, you know, uh, 400 years ago or so, uh, where unfortunately, you know, many of our brothers and sisters were taken from West Africa and brought to uh, the Americas, Cuba, Puerto Rico, uh, America, etc. So it started there, in the Kingdom of Dahomey. So I am the living uh, witness about what is we what, what we may be discussing during the, the, the panel discussion. So Benin is not the name before it's the kingdom of that moment. That, that's very good to know. So uh, I live in Thailand now. I'm in Bangkok. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I am a, a senior partner of the law firm here when it's British law firm here. And uh, I'm also uh, the founder and president of Asia Africa Foundation. Uh, I teach culture. Uh, I teach back to the roots. I teach the relevance of interaction between humans. And uh, I know very well Vietnam. I've been to Japan. I've been to Taiwan. And I'm very happy to join uh, this panel of very brilliant uh, brothers and sisters. OK. All right. OK, now we got another brother that just came to the room right now. And everyone has, we're in the process of introducing ourselves. So you actually got us at the beginning. So can you hear me? Pinnacle. Well, since we got the time, can we give a moment of silence real quick to all the brothers that's been getting killed in the U.S., okay. getting hung from trees, getting their knees, putting like, knees on their necks and all that stuff? Let's just have a moment of silence for these brothers real quick. Okay, let's have one minute of silence right now. One minute are we, of silence. Are, are we going to have another one for the sisters, too, or can we just do it all together? I think we can do it all together. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. All together, all together. All the black people get murdered. Thank okay. you. Moment of silence, very quickly. All right. I think that constitutes a nice, you know. Okay. That was a moment. That, that was a moment. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> all right, yeah. so there's me. I'm here in Taipei. Then there's uh, MC Element OP, who's in Hong Kong. There's uh, Kareem, who's in Manila, in the Philippines. Jawanza, who's in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. Dr. Roland Amasu, who's in Bangkok right now teaching. 
And the last person on the roster would be Pinnacle right here. Can you first, can you introduce yourself? Can you tell us your name, where you live right now, uh, where you come from originally, and what you're doing in the place you live right now? All right, so uh, my name is Pinnacle. My real name is Jason, but uh, my nickname is Pinnacle. People have been calling me that since I was a little kid, so it just kind of stuck with me. Uh, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I currently live in Seoul, South Korea. I have two businesses out here. One business is an entertainment company called, well, entertain, entertainment consulting company called Planet Hustle. And the other one is a, um, is a hip hop hookah lounge called Hustle. Okay. Oh, cool. yeah, All right, so excellent. Okay, let's move into the, the interview itself. So right now there's a global movement happening called Black Lives Matter. And there have been offshoots of the Black Lives Matter movement in different cities in Asia. So what Black Asia Magazine wanted to do is provide coverage for these different movements as they're happening in Asian cities. So we've been covering Tokyo, Seoul, um, Taipei. There's been some things happening in Saigon, not much, but a few things happening in other Asian cities. And the one thing that came out that I could see visibly is that I got all the organizers together, sort of. You know, all the organizers are women. And that's the first thing that stood out to me. And the other thing about it is that I still haven't been able to talk to these people. It took, it has taken me up to two weeks to get all these organizers into one room, into one space at the same time. And it's still like, you know, because a lot of them are not officially part of Black Lives Matter. So they're very limited and restricted in what they can say. Now, with that said, all of them are women. There's a very heavy female pre presence here. And in talking to these organizers, one thing that came out is where are the men? They don't see men involved in this movement, especially as it's happening in Asia, to any reasonable degree. They're like, you know, where are these guys? Are they out partying? They're not as serious as we are. They're not taking up the weight as much as we are. That seems like that was floating in the air, but the definite question that came up is that, there are, that there's very little involvement from black men. So I'm like, okay, I know all these different brothers in these different cities, and I'm like, that's a shock to me. That's a shock to everyone I spoke to. I'm like, you know, how can you be in Seoul and not know Pinnacle the Hustler? How can you be in these different major cities and not know these particular black men? And, and so I said, okay, what I can do is get these guys on a conference call and find out their various opinions about the movement, about what kind of impact it's making, and about being black in these cities and what issues are facing these communities. So let's go down the road real quickly. And the first thing I wanna ask is for you, what is Black Lives Matter? And uh, what impact is it having on cities in Asia where you are? Black Lives Matter, well, uh, that has two different de definitions. There's the literal Black Lives Matter that, that's what we're really fighting for, like uh, Black Lives Against Global White Supremacy. That's the Black Lives Matter that should be fought for every single day. But then there's the political Black Lives Matter, this movement that's going on, got random people going around torching and stuff like that, like, CIA backed and all this stuff. I don't agree with that. It's LGBT mixed up and all that. Like these protests, like we got to ask some questions here. Like, all right, you want me to go out in the street and throw up my fist and, and do what? Like what, what do these ladies, what do they want me to do in the streets with them? I'm home. I'm here like building websites. I'm here trying to make money. This is my Black Lives Matter protest. So all that symbolism and all that stuff they got going on out there. If that's how they want to fight white supremacy, that's good. That's them. I'm fighting white supremacy with my dollars. And I'll just leave it as that. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Uh, Kareem. First of all, you guys, man, I, first of all, I believe that one thing is that the racism situation is mainly a Western American thing. Let's get that straight. So us not being in the States, we were already protesting what's going on in America. And for me, it's been 10 years. I've been living abroad from my laptop, running my company. I outsourced my company. I owned a magazine in the States back in the day called Minority Success. It was the first black, black lifestyle magazine in the Midwest ever, which is crazy. I'm not that damn old, but they never had one. And I got sick of it. 
And so my way of protesting, like the brother said, um, L M N O P. I'm thinking about my, I had my alphabet in a long time. They have thinking about L M N O P. Okay. Is that the truth is, is that I believe that black men, us, we protested already. Martin Luther King is a man. You know, Malcolm X is a man. You know, Kobe, when he was doing his, he was a man. You know, you talk about, you know, um, um, Kaepernick is a man. You know, we have positions of power that many women don't have. Sorry about that. And so we can take our money, you know, because people look at the money that like Kaepernick didn't make when he was playing football. No. How much money did you lose not having Kaepernick on your damn team? And now he has a media company. He may not even come back to football unless he wants to. That's how we do it. And I believe that for me, Black Lives Matter is an American thing. And my way of proving that Black Lives Matter is, bro, like you said, we need to diversify. Every brother out there, you need to vote. Every black person in America, you need to vote. That's true. But you know what you need to do also? Get a damn passport. You know, stop investing all your money. Don't buy their freaking Gucci. Don't buy shit. You know, invest in brothers, invest in companies, or anything abroad like they do. Here in the Philippines, mm. they love black folks. They never even knew American boxing till Muhammad Ali threw them Manila. They never mm. even knew the NBA, which now is their national sport is basketball, until after Larry Bird, like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar days, right? They didn't even mm. know what the damn NBA was before Negroes came. So I think that for me abroad, the reason I am abroad is because here, I don't have to say Black Lives Matter because when I walk into a building or a room or try to do a deal, I matter already. You know, I know it. They're waiting for me to start the damn meeting. I don't need to say it. And folks that are here abroad now with the technology and the social media, now the whole world is seeing what's going on. So to say, to, and lastly, what you, what you just said about the women, I believe that the men, us, we control the purse strings right now. We are the 500 NFL players across America. The, you know, the 500 NBA players and masseuse and water boys and trainers and coaches across America. Whereas in 1950, um, Dr. I know you know this, until 1950, we couldn't even get in the NBA. So now we've taken over and we've pushed it. And now we can send in our wives and our sisters and our, and our aunties. We don't even need to show up because our sisters are so bad and so organized and so connected. They can bring the white girls, the Mexican girls, the Asian girls, and they can get the whole world to protest now through England, Asia, you know, Africa, of course, everyone's protesting. Even freaking Germany is protesting for us. I mean, right? right? The, the yeah. actual original white supremacists are saying Germany. Black Lives Matter. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and here in Asia, to say this to you too, by the way, my, my last statement, brother, here in Asia, the big thing, the President Duterte, a lot of like African presidents and other presidents nationally, because I'm in media here, the big thing now is the whole world is saying, if we did this to people, you would call the United Nations on us. You would arrest our president. You would have mm. in our country if you saw that we were killing Muslims in the street or Christians in the street or, you know, Sikh in the street or, you know, if the, the Japanese were killing the, the, the dark-skinned Japanese in the street, you would send the United Nations. It'd be a big drama. You would take over the country, kill the president and all that. And most countries now are pushing for the America to have a U United Nations sanctions on them. That's mm -hmm. what I'm hearing here abroad. So okay. I believe that the men, we've just taken a different role this time because we know that the women in America, black women, they got that. They've got more protests globally than any man has ever done. Forget the Million Man March. There okay. are millions globally marching because of what women organizers are doing right now. All right. And then the, the dudes like mm. us, we can get a damn passport, take our family abroad like you brothers have done, right? And we ain't mm -hmm. giving you no money. The only money you okay. get from me is my taxes on my PayPal account. That's all you got. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. So, okay. Thanks for sharing that. Let's go <laughs> to uh, – no, thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Let's go to Jawan's. I just want to tag along to what, to what Brother Philippines was saying. Like, the United States would have invaded the United States a long ass time. <laughs> you know I mean? I'm, I'm probably going to use that in a stand-up bit because it, it's so true, man. It's true. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, Black Lives Matter, it, it's, a, it's now a global movement to dismantle white supremacy in, in the many forms that it takes. And white supremacy is, 
is not a particularly uh, American uh, phenomenon. You know, it did, it, it, it has yeah. taken a foothold in America, but the Nazis learned it from the Americans because the eugenicists, yeah. the original eugenicists were American. And yeah. the Nazis were like, yeah, you know, we can roll with that, you know, as, yeah. and, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. But uh, white supremacy exists in Vietnam as well. I, I feel very lucky to be in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And I think in general, in comparison to a lot of places in Asia where, where I've been, uh, especially in East Asia, I'm, I'm very well received. But there is, but white supremacy exists. You know, I have a joke about, you know, when I first went to get a job, and this is true, I first went to get a job, I realized that I had to put my name J.K. Hobson on my resume because Juanza Kalunji Hobson would not get a call. And then whenever I show up, people would look at me like they got catfished. You know what I mean? Just like, <laughs> they thought I was yeah. going to be English or some shit. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so it is, <laughs> so it, 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 is a, it is a worldwide phenomenon. There's like, there's a preference for, for white English teachers. People just, and a lot of it is ignorance. When people think of an American, even sometimes if you just think, it, if I just said an American, right? You probably think of some white dude with like a MAGA hat or some shit like that. And so yeah. that's, you know, that's a part of, I think, all of our, our positions in, in the movement is to show people an example, you know, rather than something they get from the media of, of who black people are. We're all very lucky. And uh, I'm sorry, your, your name in the Philippines again? What's your name? Kareem. 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 Yeah, they call and me you, Jackson. You, they call me Jackson, brother. All right. All right. Jackson could, could probably attest to this. Like what it's like to be a black man abroad in the age of Obama versus something else. You know what I mean? Because before Obama, it was like, you know, who did, who did you have as, 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 and I'm not saying he's the perfect example of anything, but what I'm saying is just his presence alone gave people around the world a different idea of, of uh, just a, an alternative view of what a black man could be. And I think, you know, we're, we're all doing that. That's part of, of all of our, our missions here. I originally came here as a, as a Fulbright scholar. And so I was very aware of that mission then. But it continues on, and you know, and I talk about white supremacy and white privilege, which uh, white privilege is the cousin of white mediocrity. You know, I talk about that in my stand-up a lot because they know there are no mediocre brothers or sisters out here in 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 the world. You know what I'm saying? Like we're all out here hustling and doing that. But if, if we were mediocre, we wouldn't even be out here. And I make sure to let white people all know that shit from the stage all the time. Um, in terms of the protests, you know, um, bodies are important. You know, it is, you know, it, it does seem like it's just, you know, it, it's just optics, but just people being out there, you know, we've been fighting for this shit for over half a century and more and more. But I'm but talking you were about saying like in Saigon, they're not allowed to protest. Is that right? Well, yeah, we're not. Yeah, they, they, there's not even Vietnamese people try to protest. They put the because it is. For the most part, I experience more freedom here, much more than I experience in the, in the United States. But there's certain things, this, this is still a, it's still a semi-repressive government. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, can't even, I can't even openly practice my religion here because it's, it's not a sanctioned religion. You know, okay. like I can't get what? together in groups of more than five people. Yeah, 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 I'm a Nietzschean wow. Buddhist. And, uh, wow. and yeah, so we get together in small groups, we don't have like any official meeting places. It's just like just a clandestine Buddhist practice. And you would think, hey, it's a Buddhist country, but it's a different, it's a little, it's a little bit of, of a different kind of Buddhism. So, um, yeah. you know, so all that is to say that these protests happening, you know, it's, you know, things have been pushing forward, but I think we can all agree that these last, this last month, month and a half has been has been notable, you know, and yeah. I do realize that the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, you know, was founded by three queer black women. I'm, I'm actually friends with Patrice Colors. I know her from the, the Ifa community, which is a Yoruba religion. Uh, and we both used to practice Ifa in, in Los Angeles. And I, I know her heart. And I think the thing is, and we talked a little bit about this uh, before, Wes, mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, the black Americans, we can agree that as black people in America, we have a certain perspective of America that is not the American agreed upon. You know, Americans for the most part think of America as land of the free, land of opportunity. A lot of immigrants would agree and fairness and equality and all shit. 
And as black people, we have a different perspective, you know? And I think the thing is that you have to listen to the most marginalized people. And who is more marginalized? You think, well, as the black man, we are the most marginalized people, but black women and black queer people experience racism in a different way. And you, if you look at intersectionality, you say, well, you know what? Yeah, there's been a lot of trans people that have been murdered, but it's not even talked about in the mainstream. You know what I mean? When usually when it's the people they'll talk about in the mainstream is when a black man is murdered by the police. You know what I mean? I mean, we can go down the line. Sandra Bland is, it wasn't caught on camera, but she's not nearly as talked about. So I think that the movement Black Lives Matter means all black lives. It means okay. all black lives. And I, I okay. think that's, and I think that that's, uh, and I think that that's true. And that's, and that's important. Um, right. Okay. But, so Dr. Roland Amasu, uh, same two questions. Uh, this, the movement that's happening right now, what's your take on it? What does it mean? And how are people receiving this there in Thailand? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to join your panel. Yes, uh, here, um, uh, what it means to me as an African, uh, uh, black African staying and living in Thailand, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's most important is about justice. Uh, it's, it's too much, has become too much. One is accident, two is occurrence, three is a pattern. So we've been witnessing, and the whole world have been witnessing so much injustice against blacks by the police in America that I think it has been too much, and then the whole world has been reacting against injustice. So I think it's, it's not for us about being black, it's about the police violence and witnessing, seeing on video, recorded, a human being, being murdered, being denied humanity with so much violence by a professional, by a law enforcement officer whose job, whose responsibility is to protect, but ending up in killing that way. I think this is a trigger. The first trigger is, is not necessarily related to the racial or, or the being black because it had been happening so, for so long and, and why it didn't, the, the protest didn't happen before, you know? Blacks have been protesting since Martin Luther King, even before. And mm. then have been uh, opened the way uh, to the, the civil rights. You, you know that more than me. But it has not reached that level you know, of global reaction. I think something beyond the blackness has touched the people around the world. That's why you can see a reaction all over the world, in, uh, you know, in Europe, even in Germany. You know, Germany, can you imagine Germany? Germany where the history of Nazism which is basically the, uh, the, uh, the top of the white supremacist policy. They are, they are protesting millions in France and in, in, uh, uh, in uh, Lisbon, wherever in the Europe, all right? So what you may not know is that the protest is also happening in Africa, in my own country, in Benin. Yes, uh, in a way you cannot even imagine because uh, the, uh, the, uh, the religious, the traditional, religious priests gather to celebrate uh, uh, or to, to pay tribute to the murder to the, to the, by a ritual, a special voodoo ritual to punish the spirit of the murderer, which is the wife. You know, this is something you might not understand. Yeah, the, I heard about this. Yeah. So there were a very big ritual. You can find some of the videos on, on YouTube where you see those priests gathering together with a photo of George uh, uh, Floyd and praying for his soul, and you know, uh, and and uh, sending uh, sending punishment, spiritual punishment, spell spells, you know, uh, against the spirit of the murderer. So it mm -hmm. goes beyond America. It goes beyond being black. It's something that touched the whole humanity uh, as a human being. A, a, you know, uh, a exaggeration of uh, abuse of violence, and and the, the limitation. So this is my take. This is uh, my 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 understanding. Because uh, since I came to Thailand, you know, uh, now 15 years ago, I have been personally involved in, uh, in, in uh, the uh, respect and dignity of black people in Bangkok, in Thailand. Well, a... The reason is, as an African, I realized that our presence will have very little impact because very few Africans can legally exist 
and work in Thailand because the paperwork and the, 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 the process are very complicated and it's not easy to be to enter the, the work, you know, uh, the, the work community here when you're black. It's not easy uh, for di different reasons that already, uh, uh, you know, mentioned by, you know, being, it's better if you want to, to work as a teacher to be white, you know, so that you, you represent the idea of excellence that they can see mm. here as what is good as opposed to what is bad when you are black. Black means not always good things here. It's not about racism per se. It's about the perception. It's about the understanding. It's about the value, about what's good, what brings opportunity, and what doesn't bring opportunity. It's as, it's as simple as that. You know, there are three levels of racism. You have the hardcore racism that you find in America, which is based on the white supremacy, right? Uh, and then also, which leads to systemic racism. What is, it become a policy which is sustained by the law enforcement. And you have the second kind of racism that you find in, in Europe, which is more related to the, uh, the past of colonial relationship between former colonial rulers and the, the colony. And then you have the last one, which I witnessed in Asia, which is more a, a, a racism of, 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 of opportunity, meaning that you know, being, being recognized or perceived as white brings you a better life brings you opportunity, make you look beautiful. And this is a value, you know, this is, a, it's, it's not, there is nothing, there is no hatred. It's business, it's an opportunity. And as you might know, the whitening industry here is billion dollars, uh, you know? Yeah. And there is nothing, there is nothing personal. It's just yeah. about, oh, being black, being white is cool. You can make money, you can have a good life in, in the society. So this is the perception. As far as, the movement, as far as the movement is concerned in Thailand, uh, it's almost the same as in Vietnam. Uh, the, the black presence is very limited to begin with, and most of the black here are not living here legally. So how can you protest in a country if your, your, your very existence is not recognized legally? You cannot, you know, you cannot walk in the street and start to protest while your existence as a person living legally in the country is not recognized. So hmm. what I noticed is the movement of our sisters. Uh, for example, I don't know if you know uh, Tori Rogers. She's an amazing uh, lady from America. Uh, we yeah. work together. We've been doing uh, the Black ma uh, the Black Lives Matter before the murder of, of, of uh, George Floyd. We have been creating the Afro Magic movement. We organize, this, uh, we organize festivals. We get together, we organize a seminar, panel discussion on topics that are related to our community. So we've been doing this. We didn't wait for the protest to make it happen. So okay. uh, in the conclusion, I think this is a trigger of an awareness that, uh, of something that is happening in the world, but we must continue, every, if, if, every one of us, wherever you are, doing what you do the best and being uh, the proud of our community. All right, thank you very much, doctor, for sharing that, Roland. All right, Pinnacle, thank you for hanging on. Okay, so um, the question goes to you now. Yeah, so um, I think it was, I can't remember, I think it was uh, Brother Hobson that said, uh, one of y'all basically broke it down as far as the um, political aspect of it is, which was dismantling white supremacy. Mm. And um, I think that's a very, very good definition for what it is as far if, if, if we're defining the movement Black Lives Matter. But I, I don't know if we can necessarily say dismantling white supremacy because I feel like white supremacy is a mindset. You know what I'm saying? Like people are going to believe that they're better than other people based on their skin color. Like I think that's just going to permeate throughout the entire human existence from, from beginning to whenever we end. But dismantling systematic oppression and systematic racism I feel is, um, at least from my standpoint, is a more uh, potent definition that I will go with. Uh, as far as the social aspects of what does Black Lives Matter means, I've had to explain this to quite a few people because, you know, people are always, I think there's some confusion. People are always like, why is it Black Lives Matter? Like, you know, why don't people say all lives matter and all this stuff? And it's like, look, we're not saying that Black lives are more important than any other lives. It's actually, it's a shame that we even have to say Black Lives Matter. The fact of the matter is, our lives matter. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. We also matter. You know what I mean? Like the fact that the fact that people that is you can literally walk around and die, 
in America from the people that are supposed to protect you and the people that killed you don't receive any kind of justice or any kind of uh, penalty, penalty or punishment from killing a black dude, obviously there's something wrong with that. So, um, so from, from the social aspect of Black Lives Matter, for me, it's, it's more, um, it's more um, educating people that are unaware of what's really going on. So that, that would be my way of defining those. Thanks for the okay. question. Not a problem. All right, next question. Let's move a little, let's move forward with this. Um, all of you have just spoken at length about the things you've been doing out here in Asia, what you've all been building. So why is it that this movement on both sides of the globe, and anyone can punch in on this, it doesn't know where the men are. I, and I, I've got you right here. You're obviously right here. Why is it that they don't know where the men are and they can't find you and they don't know what you have done or contributed or what you can't contribute? Is there a reason for that? Is that real? And if so, why? Where is that coming from? Well, I can't speak for everybody, but uh, you no. Know, to some degree, everybody has their own platform. You know what okay. I'm saying? So, however you want to, however you want to fight the uh, the system or f fight for equality or you know fight for equal rights or whatever, use your platform to do it. So I've been blessed to have to you know to be able to build this uh, this venue. So, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we did a fundraiser for George Floyd and other people that have passed away due to uh, police brutality. Um, we have a Black Lives Matter Korea event happening next next month. Uh, another fundraiser, you know what I'm saying, so we can help support. I mean, really, it's all about raising awareness and, and providing support. Um, I put out stuff on my, on, on my Instagram. I mean, I don't have like, you know, a million followers or nothing like that, but even if I can influence and educate one person, then that's better. That's at least one more person that knows that knows something about our struggle. And you know, you just like Tupac said, I might not be the one to change the world, but I spark the mind that does. You never know who, what, what kind of mind you're gonna spark. So, you know, if if people not, it don't even matter to be honest with you. If people see you doing something or not, you know, I don't really care about that. The fact of the matter is, are you doing something? Are you getting out? I mean, whatever it is, getting out on in the street, uh, posting pictures you know what I'm saying, talking to people, educating people, reading books to educate yourself so you can have more in-depth discussions. It, it doesn't matter, like whatever it is that you do, as long as you're doing something to push our culture forward, it doesn't matter if people see you or not. Cause I mean, what matters is your impact. Are you making an impact? Okay, all right. Does anyone else want to punch in on that question? I had a question for you, Wes. Like, who specifically are these women asking where are the, the men? The organizers of all the Black Asian uh, Black Lives Matter movements in Asia. So Tokyo, Seoul, Osaka, Taipei, and also probably in Hong Kong. They're all women, and they've expressed to me, like, you know, we don't see that much involvement from men. You don't see that many. You had, like, uh, I mean, not you, but I'm talking about them. You had, like, the... Uh, it's just a whole slew of black men walking down the street. We're here in Asia. It's not like we're here to begin with. You're like, where are the black men? It's like, you see one black man for every 100 people. So like, what are they talking about? Well, I think, okay. I think if I could just, uh, I think what, what Wes is saying, like specifically uh, in terms of, of, uh, of making connections with the Black Lives Matter movement. In, in Vietnam, there's, there's, no, there's no official movement. Um, we, we have done, uh, just last Sunday, uh, we had a Saigon is Listening uh, event where mm -hmm. I was a part of a panel of, of uh, four black folks. Uh, there were black men on the panel. There were black men who were mod moderators of, this, of the discussions. And the discussions uh, included uh, other expats and local Vietnamese people who are, who are trying to understand. I just made a video about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and what does it mean. A, a lot of our job is a little bit different because we're trying, we're having to explain this to a foreign audience, you know? It's a lot of the way a lot of the people see it here is like, you know, well shit, they had Obama and Jay-Z is rich. Like why are people complaining? We, and we, so we're doing the groundwork of, of having to let people know. Um, so, I mean, yeah, and we're all, I think we're all making an impact in our, in our, in our own way, in our own specific fields. I can't speak for, for what, what those women are talking about because again mm -hmm. there's no movement here and people know where to find me i get i get requests all the time hey do you want to speak at this panel you want to do this video i was asked to mc 
a July 4th event uh, for the Democrats abroad, which I actually turned down because uh, yeah. I just, I think that it's, a, it's, it's good for us as people who are outspoken about these issues to be aware, because you know, this is kind of a wave that's happening, but I also want to make sure it's not a trend. Yeah. And I also want to like, you know what I mean? I want to make sure people are being sincere and I don't want my face and my voice to be co-opted so somebody can be like, you know, yeah, see, look at me. You know what I mean? Like they're yeah. like virtue signaling by, you know, here's my black friend, you know? So, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, let's start moving towards the end of the interview. Um, I just wanted to touch on this very quickly, very briefly. Okay, okay. Um, with the rallies, with what's been happening out here in Asia, there's always going to be that element. You're always going to see people online who are like, okay, don't do this. You're going to be attacked. Uh, I don't want to see protests from black people. And they have been, as, as these Facebook pages are popping up, there are white supremacists who come on the Facebook pages and make threats and things like that. Is from where you're sitting, from your point of view, is some element of protection necessary? So is that something we should be thinking about? Or it's like, nah, it's not, it's not even relevant to the conversation. Well, that's you know? human nature. I mean, well, I mean, as black men, you know, they're doing their best to make us docile and all that stuff. But, you know, especially, like, because I'm married and stuff like that, like, I have to protect my family. So when it comes down to it, if I have to defend myself, then that's what's going down. But just to go out there and cause harm to somebody else, we ain't knowing that. But, mm -hmm. you know, back in the day, you know what I'm saying, they was beating us down left and right. The peaceful protest, getting knocked up upside the head. Well, I was a, I, I, I was a good boy. I ain't going to hit your back, man. No, fuck that. These days, <laughs> you you attack me, I'm gonna beat your ass. So that's my. Okay. No, I think that I think it's actually safer for us than it is in the states, man. It's it's actually safer because mm -hmm. you guys understand. Like I said before, with your question, with where are the black guys at, I said before before we were taping is that the black guys we're the ones that are paving the way for everything that's being happening back home, and mm -hmm. I believe that the women organizers that's what you do good. That's the power of the black woman is organizing, networking, pushing. The black dudes, we're the butlers before. We're the slaves in the field before. You know, we're the ones, we're the Martin Luther Kings and the, and the Malcolm X's and the, the Kobe Bryant, when he was here, he had a, he, many, many non-for-profit foundations he worked with. Um, we're the, uh, we're, we're the we're, that's who we are. And our power comes from the four plus trillion dollars that black Americans earn every year and spend every year in America. And by us being black professional men, and like I think um, Hobson said, maybe, um, in order for us to be abroad, we can't be your average Negro. Mm -hmm. So when we're here, we're the ones in the ear of the president of the country where we're at, the governors where we're at. We're the ones on the TV, on the radio shows, like you guys are saying, we're the ones. My show has totally been co-opted by explaining my blackness, like you're saying. That's me. Hmm. My whole business, entrepreneurial, Philippines tourism, don't nobody care about that no more. Filipinos want to know what is up with these white folks in America. Hmm. Because here, uh -huh. they see the same thing. I know this is the case in Africa. Hmm. I lived in Africa for a while, too. I lived in Nigeria. I lived in Ikeja and Victory Island in Africa. I went to American International School. And here, just like in Africa, you see these old, decrepity, freaked up, fat, out of shape white dudes, these young women yeah. from mm. Africa or Asia or wherever, and they can't do that shit back home. Mm. And so what happens for us here, me at least, especially because of my platform, I'm in media, I could actually call it out because I'm somebody. They're, they're, they, they don't look at me as below the white dude. And I can actually explain to these people, Filipinos, for example, like, what's this dude doing here? If we're in the States, this white dude wouldn't even be in the room with us. I'm not sure about where you guys are in Asia, but here in the Philippines Islands, they know more about Black history than most Black Americans do. Yeah, that's so true. They, Philippines, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, yeah, their perspective is like, well, y'all built the White House anyway. You know, y'all, hmm. y'all. I saw pictures of you Black women feeding, breastfeeding white babies. I mean, so hmm. if you're a nanny in the Philippines, you don't want to be taught by no white ass nanny. Hmm. You to go to a yeah. Black nanny. You know, if you're in the Philippines, you don't you don't want to go to the white club. You like, where's that niggas club at again? Pinnacle, where's your club at? Or LMK? Who got a club? LMNLP. 
They going to Elemental Peace Place. They ain't going to the, they, unless it's a rich place where they can find celebrities yeah. and make, make money. But the regular locals, they know, we know the party, we know how to market, we know how to build. So when they ask where we are, black men, I believe, I could be wrong, are a lot of the reason that the world is protesting right now. Because we're all over the world and we've explained this shit. Because when they say to you, brothers, you tell me the truth. What's the first question you get when you go somewhere? Well, why'd you leave America? I hmm, love hmm. America. Why are you here? Am I correct? Yeah. yeah. If you anything yeah. like me, I answer the fucking question. Let me tell you why. And then when you yeah. break it down, they like, well, yeah, you know yeah. what? You're right. If it wasn't for niggas protesting, I wouldn't have a job in America. I wouldn't be thinking about going to America. Right. For real. I couldn't even drink out the fountain. Mm. So when yeah, they I, say, I'd like to comment on oh, Karim. Karim. Go ahead. I'm sorry, it's brother. Very, I'm very very ahead, brother. Being, black, being black in Asia, uh, the experience of being black in Asia depends actually on where in Asia you are living. Yeah. And your but example is on the Philippines is very interesting. Depends, depends on where you are living. Yeah. yeah, I can tell you that the level of education of exposure to culture of the Philippines is much more higher than the level of education exposure to culture of the, of the Thai because mm. of, of the system or because of the, the way they are educated, the, 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 the way they are taught at school, the way the curriculum you know, in, integrates the black history or African history. There is none of those in Thailand. Yeah. So most of the people I interact with, they don't even know, you know the difference between Africa and America, sometimes they have no clue. So, and as Pinak was saying, it's a matter of platform, you know? Okay, I am the founder and president of a, a, a charity, which was created precisely for the reason that I realized 15 years ago that there is such a cultural gap, educational gap that needs to be filled. But I am not the United Nation. I am not the government. I'm just a simple African guy who realize that there is something need to be done to bridge culture. So I created the foundation with my own money. I saw the land in my country to raise the money to be able to create a charity in Thailand so that I can share, I can have a platform to share something that is needed, which means if you don't know me, you cannot judge me. You know, it's not because I'm black. Dr. I'm Dr. Roland, but Dr. Roland, can I put this to you? We have can I say this to you? Can I say this to you as a black American to an African brother, right? Yeah. You doing that represents black people because the benefit that we have, they see us all as black. Yeah. So they know, especially for an African, you're spending yeah. one to 100, 200, 300 to invest in Thailand. Am I correct? Yes. So you are, they know when they meet you, damn, these Negroes, they really can do this stuff. Because you don't, we, what we do as Americans, and I believe that Africans do it too, black people, we do this all the time because we're used to racism. If you're not really a racist person or a racist country, and I mean against color, if you're not racist, what you see when you see us, all you, us in this room right now, you see what black people can do times how many millions of black expats around the world over the past 50 years all right okay. i think that um, the difference is that they yeah. see the value they see it that's yeah. why they let you do what you do all right all so right to conclude mm -hmm. let me Mehuna, let me conclude then yeah. going to korea i've been to, i've been to korea my own girlfriend is, is korean right and i i've been practicing i'm connected to the korean culture through the martial arts i'm black belt taekwondo you know, and then okay. I learn, I learn Korean culture. I have most of my friends, even in Thailand here, are Korean. So I can tell you that among all Asian nations today, one of the best countries with awareness of opening to the culture is Korea, is South Korea. They are, they are at the head, they are advanced, they are at the ultimate level of embracing the black culture, K-pop, you know, many things like that, and really, I, I hat off to the Korea, the Korean people. They are really we, doing their homework, and they are doing their best to bridge, you know, culture and say we are all the same, you know. And the new generation of Korean are doing that work, but you don't find that. I uh, wholeheartedly disagree with you, brother. Yeah, I agree. I would disagree. Wholeheartedly. Right. So disagree. I think Pinnacle would know about this the most. Pinnacle, what would you say about that? 
There's definitely – I don't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry, but I just got to make this clear. Like, definitely disagree. Yeah. There's a lot of – there are there are, there are definitely Korean people out here. Actually, you know what? Put it like this. Every culture, every society that's ever existed on the face of this earth, in every country, there's some terrible, garbage, trash human beings. Yeah. And, then, and there's also some wonderful people, right? And then, you know, you have – how the culture or their society move um, as as a as a unit as groupthink, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of times you meet individuals or you'll meet subcultures or subgroups that go against the groupthink. All right, is everybody following right now? Yeah, and absolutely. Oh yeah, I see. Fans are some of the some of the most difficult people I've ever encountered in my life. They don't really like anybody. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like it's like the other side of a racist dude being like, "Well, I got a black friend," you know. It's like, "Well, I got a Korean friend that's not racist." <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, but don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to be disrespectful to Korean people because yeah. I mean, just off of what I just said, I've met some absolutely wonderful people here. I got fr mm -hmm. Korean friends that I hope I'm you know continue to have a relationship with them for the rest of my life. But this society is not. <laughs> Korean society isn't like, yeah, black people. Nah. <laughs> you got it all. In, in the Philippines, they don't, they don't have they're they're like, like, yeah, black problem. people. That's why I like it. In the Philippines, they're like, yeah, black people. Well, here, well here's the all other right, thing that you, so, you have an advantage. All right, all right, guys, 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 guys. Let me right. moderate a little bit. Let me make sure we move forward to the next one. We're pretty much wrapping up the interview. Um, all of us know each other right now as black men who live out here in Asia. The reason why Black Asia Magazine even exists is to create some kind of connective tissue between individuals who are Black, between Black communities that are all springing up out here in Asia so that we can all share our resources, our intellect, our knowledge, our information, if and when that need arises. So as far as the question that sparked this interview, where are the men? I know all of you. And what I've seen is that the movement doesn't know these men, but all of you men are out here doing your own like lone wolf things. Everyone has their own individual projects going on. Um, I don't think any of us are going moving out of Asia anytime soon. So the question is, do we continue doing our own lone wolf thing or like what are we building out here in Asia? Going forward, looking to the future, do we continue just on the individual roads of our own individual projects or do we do things that are more community based and where is that going? What are we building out here as black men so that we can hand this down to the future and we can stabilize our people out here. So let's go down the list. Let's start with Pinnacle first and go down the list. So Pinnacle, do you have any thoughts on that question I just asked? Yeah, actually, um, I want to I wanna see some more black business owners out here. It's really tough to, to set up a business. And I made, a, I, let, I made a lot of mistakes and I made a lot of failures on the road to where I'm at. And, um, you know, I, I definitely... I definitely think that I'm able to to help help people learn how to support themselves more than just being teachers out here. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but there's there's still a lot more that I need to learn before I can really start helping other people. And um, you know, I have to I have to strengthen my platform first before I can really extend that platform to other people and support other people uh, to help them get to the point to where they can support themselves. But that's actually one of my midterm goals. That's, that's one of the things that I'm working on now. So I'm, I'm trying to expand my business as fast as possible so that I can start helping other people as fast as possible. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, next up is Roland. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, you know, your, your, your question is, is, uh, is very uh, dear to me because this is exactly what I've tried to do when I came to Thailand. Uh, I created a, a foundation. There is no better organization uh, to, to create communities than, uh, than a charity. So that was my vision. I see there, is, there was a void. There was no one to see, no African, no black people. So I say, let me create a, a platform, a charity. So I created the organization. All right. But the problem is organization need funding. You know, you need support, you need fundraising. And... Uh, uh, is my fundraising strategy has not been successful. So many of the projects that we have tried uh, to implement were not very successful. That's why we are not known. We are known as an organization, but our, uh, you know, we have not been able to, uh, to, to realize, you know, uh, global, uh, you know, thing that could impact the world. 
So I totally support your idea that we need to create a, we need to create a, a community. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it can be. It could be a platform, you know, with a digital platform now, it can be very easy. That can be led by yourself, you know, and bring people together and uh, see how we can generate, uh, you know, uh, the funding. Because most important is the money. We need money. You need fuel. You need resources to achieve objectives. So that is the most important thing. If we can create a platform or an organization that allow all the black people to channel their resources into one fund that can support each of us, that would be fantastic. Okay. All right. All right. So next up is Jawanza. I'm now you got my full attention. Jawanza, same question. What are we building? What are we moving towards? <laughs> well, I think the thing is, you know, it's, it's uh, well, I'm still on my grind. I'm, I'm in entertainment. You know what I mean? So I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of stand up. And I think for me, it's, it's a really good way to engage. And, you know, I can say the wildest shit. And I can say the most, you know, the realest shit, you know, and, and that's, that's what the platform is for. That's what I use it for. I think it's really a good way for me to engage with people on, on really important topics because humor is a way of like really, you know, just diffusing a lot of things and you could just say things and you know people have to listen um that said you know th there might be this disparity between uh what women are doing and what we're doing as individuals you know i try to you know lend my support support the women because they're they're here for us i mean whether there's like a, a you know there's a lot of men at the forefront of black lives matter the, the women are out there and they're on the streets for us they're on the streets for george floyd it started with Trayvon Martin, which, yeah, and remember, it wasn't a police officer that killed Trayvon Martin. It was a regular ass dude, right? So yeah. the women are going to bat for us. So I think it's really important to support them when we can. That's why anytime ask, anybody asks me to, to do an event like the one I did last week or to write something or to make a video, you know, like I'm down to do it, you know? So I'm going to continue doing what I do. And Hopefully when things open up again and we're able to travel again, I'll be seeing some of you on the road. So I'm yeah. glad you started this, uh, this group chat uh, so yeah. that we have, we have this connection. It's kind of like a, like a, a underground railroad of black travelers, you know, and then, oh, you know the places to go, you know what we can do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. Yeah, we need that. So yeah, let's continue on. All right, thank you. All right, Kareem, you're up next. Kareem, let's try to keep it about a minute or so, all right? <laughs> Okay. And, you know, but I, one, one thing that I do, and I'm going to go back to the Africa comment, was that I was a kid who was a successful family. The, my family is a Jackson family from the Midwest in, in California. My dad went to Africa, to Nigeria to do business in the 70s, and that's how our family became successful. That's it. So my idea is that I believe that like, we need to really work with people back home directly, helping them, like Brother said, um, Pinnacle. Um, about helping them get into business, helping them learn that, that you can diversify your income, you can invest abroad, you can buy a ticket, get a passport, because that's what I've seen through my family over three generations, because we've always been an international family. We could do anything, maybe push the Black Asia magazine more, maybe create groups and seminars and things specifically showing Black folks how to quit their damn jobs. If you're working hmm. a rinky job in America, and you're paying the rent, working at freaking McDonald's, the restaurant, you know those wiki big ass jobs, you, you drive in the damn bus. If you're doing any of those things in America, you can succeed anywhere in the world. So why are you worried about issues in Africa or in Asia with the lights or the infrastructure when your lights are turned out every month anyway? You can't pay the bills, you're struggling. So you might mm -hmm. as well struggle be global because mm. as you guys have all seen, at least here, you're the baddest club in town. You're not just doing a black night on Thursdays at some bar. You know what I'm saying? Whether you choose Africa or Asia, they need to get a passport and get the hell out and see the world because then this is not an issue anymore. It, it, it goes away. It, we don't have this issue. So if they can understand, get a freaking passport, travel, and I don't mean the Bahamas either, travel and learn business because they realize we built America. You can build anywhere. And from what I see, none of us here are Harvard graduates, none of us here from the, you know, the Kennedy family or anything like that, we're self-made brothers. So if we could do it, anybody could do it. And when they realize that they can choose to work or invest anywhere in the world, that's when white folks back home are gonna realize, okay, wait a second, these black folks are getting smart. 
now there's only two trillion and not four trillion a year in black spending power, but they're sending two trillion outside the country. You know, all of a sudden we're not buying Cadillacs and Gucci shoes anymore. We're buying passports mm -hmm. and we're investing in brothers like you guys or in clubs and events and bars are the, are the thing that Roland talked about. We're investing in funds across the country. Like every other foreigner in America does when they make dollars, they send it back home. We just don't have a home. So I think that we mm -hmm. need to do more to get black people empowered into business, getting away from that racist crap, but we don't realize it. And I think that's what our voice can do to help Black Lives Matter, to make them All realize right. you matter. You don't need to settle for this shit. Okay. You need to beg for this All shit right. no more. All you right. know, you can create your own anywhere in the world and make America like I do your summer home. Right. Okay. Excellent. All right. Uh, K Solo. Let's Yo. finish up strong. The so, one word you mentioned was community. Yeah. Now, all the community is, yeah, a community is just a bunch of people who swap money together. That's it. The Jews, the Arabs, the Chinese, they are the masters of building communities. No matter where they go, they dollars are swapping. If you put a dollar into the Jewish community, that dollar is not leaving that community until it touched at least eight to 10 more Jewish people hands. So that's what we need to get into the habit of a better community. And what we're doing here, I mean, like you're in Taiwan, we got my homeboy in the Philippines, homeboy in Korea. Whatever we got going on, let's just like try to do our best to support each other's resources. So with you, you have your Asian magazine. If mm -hmm. everybody here was to do a, get a subscription, that's building a community. I got my YouTube channel. If everybody here dropped a like and subscribe and commented and something, they, oh, that's, that's community right there. Homeboy, he got his own um, club and stuff like that. If we promote it, or um, the guy, he's a comedian. If he got a show, we can share what he's doing and have some of our other Asian friends, if they happen to be in Korea, they could come by and support him. That's the network. And like what um, Mr. Kareem was saying, also, we need to do this a lot more often. Like this mm -hmm. little panel thing, right. this right here is building community. You know what I'm saying? So. We think of this as like a think tank, you know what I'm saying? So it's like yeah. step by step, you know what I'm saying? So I'll just keep it short, but that's All right. My okay, last but not least, is there anything anyone wants to plug? Do you have like a, a business? Uh, what, what you got going on? Your entrepreneurship? Your uh, Anything anyone wants to say very quickly about your endeavors? Anything like that? I'll go first. Uh... My YouTube channel, please check me out. It's fresh out. I just made it professional and everything. MC Element OP 305 on YouTube, all right? Check it out. I have more than like almost like 150 hours of content. So like okay. check it out if you want a good laugh and things like that. Okay. All right. Anything else? Anyone else? Well, I see. I got my yeah. website, you guys. I'm, like, I'm gonna. They can always go to KareemAntonio.com, you guys. Um, they can click on my shows. My shows are there. My YouTube channel is Kareem Jackson Live on the set, you guys. And I really think that we need to really, really think about how we can promote ourselves more in a more direct way. So if we can come together, maybe create a publication with you or, or, or promote our websites, let's do that. And mainly I'm pushing a big package right now where we're pushing for black Americans to get passports, to get a, a tour to come to the Philippines actually um, for either a six week or a six month like a hiatus. And I've done this for three years in a row for rich white folks. So now I'm realizing, let me bring the brothers to really see it. And then um, we also do oh, wow. websites for small business people and we help them for $350. We help them to get a website for their business or their practice or whatever, so they can get global and learn how to make money online and get the hell out of hood. I mean, I'm America, come on, you guys. They're struggling back home. Right, so okay. All well, right, anyone else? Rolling, you said yeah, you have yeah, a book yeah. out. Uh, yeah, my, my contribution is very, is very simple. You know, I started building community, as I told you, since 15 years ago. I have a foundation, I have a website, I have a Facebook group, this Asia Africa Foundation. Asia Africa Foundation in one word. You know, okay. so, you know, bridging that down in the comments. for the best, the best in you know, business opportunity, the best in education, the best in culture. You know, I teach, I even teach, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I teach African dancing. <laughs> I teach salsa dancing. I'm known better as a dancer than as a lawyer. It's funny because of those activities. So we can really, you know, uh, capitalize on the best we have, our different talents, and build a beautiful future. 
I think this is a very good start, and I want to thank you, my brother, for inviting me here. All right, thank you. Okay, Jawanza, Pinnacle, anything you want to say? Yeah. I'll keep uh, it really quick. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you know, go ahead, brother. I'll wait. I'll, I'll do really quick. Uh, JK Hobson on Instagram, Asia Out Loud on Facebook. We're going to make a YouTube soon. Just, just add all that stuff, and I'll, I'll keep you up to date with comedy and tour dates and other writing-related projects that I'm working on. Uh, website is PinnacleToHustler.com. And uh, if you want to check out anything hustle related, just uh, look up Hustle Ite One on um, on Google or Instagram. So. Okay, cool. All right, that should be it. And thank you all for your time, for your participation, for your support. Cool. Hey, All right, Black Asian Magazine. Guys.